triumphed just because his is better or something. I don't think that's why. He triumphs because the Jerusalem center is wiped out in the war against Rome. Fortunate for him, all the leadership, whoever were in Jerusalem, were annihilated in the war against Rome. They didn't participate in the war against Rome, you say. No, I'm not sure that they didn't participate. Because the Dead Sea Scrolls are the same thing. All the Dead Sea Scrolls disappeared, too. That's why they're in the caves. And the reason no one came back to get these valuable documents is that they all perished or were taken as slaves to Rome or executed or whatever. They all participated in the war against Rome because they saw it as a final apocalyptic war against all evil on the earth. And we have uh, sort of like uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini or somebody like that. It's, uh, we have the document that come run called The War of the Sons of Light Against the Sons of Darkness, outlining the blueprint for this final apocalyptic war on earth. That's why the scrolls are so important. So it, 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 the polling didn't just triumph because maybe it was superior. It may have been. I can't trust that. It also triumphed because there was no one out there left who really could testify against it overseas because the Palestinian center was obliterated. Uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's some of you. There's an interesting book on this subject by a Christian minister called S.G.F. Brandon. That's probably the best book I've ever read on the subject. Written back in the 50s. The Fall of Jerusalem. I, I'll give you a, a, a book list if you can look at it. The Fall of Jerusalem and the Early Christian Church, where he, 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 he shows this conclusion, how the Fall of, of Jerusalem had an impact on the Early Christian Church. When did Jerusalem fall? 70 A.D. So uh, James died, 62 A.D. Paul, we don't know, but in, somewhere in those cataclysms from 62 to 70, Paul seems to have been executed. Okay, we don't have a clear picture of when, how, why, but probably in the roundups of um, agitators that was going on in Rome in the wake of the uprising against Rome, all these people were uh, caught in the net whether they were guilty or not, they were caught in that and sent to their fate. This is a huge, huge roundup. I can well imagine there might be. Okay, so I haven't proved anything. What I'm just trying to show you is um, why all these books like the Antiquities are so important. I got back to where I started. Why is the Antiquities? The Antiquities has testimony to James. It's not in the war. The war he wrote in the 70s, the antiquities he wrote in the 90s, when he obviously felt much safer. He had been gone to Rome, he'd been adopted into the Roman imperial family, and he felt that he could uh, be more forthcoming. Uh, the war doesn't have John the Baptist. The antiquities has John the Baptist. And a very telling testimony, the one I told you about last time. So the antiquities is much more detailed. But for our purposes, hey, I got back to where I started. I shouldn't have gone off like that. I was going to do this. Anyway, the war is much is much easier. And all you would have to do is read up to uh, the outbreak of the war, which is about 150 pages. You don't have to read all through what happened during the war and so on and so forth. You don't even have to read up to the outbreak of the war if you don't want to. You can read Herod's predecessors, Herod's rise to power, Herod's master of Palestine, Herod's murder of his wife and his heirs and his children. Nice chap like Saddam Hussein as I told you. Rise of Archelaus in the Roman census period. Judea under Roman rule. And basically you've got the whole background. So that's about a, a 150 pages that you could read it sometime if you want. I'll, I'll try to summarize it here. I'll keep you for five more minutes because I was five minutes late. I apologize. I'll, I was ten minutes late, but I'll keep, keep you for five. I'd like to go back where are we going to start? Let's start at the beginning. Let's see how we got to the state of Jesus coming in Palestine. You can't just take it out of context as a, an event that has no prehistory. So a lot of people don't know the prehistory. We can look at it quick. Some of you have heard this from me in other classes, and I apologize. We start, I don't think we should start with Adam and Eve. That's where the Bible starts. Uh, we should get into where it gets more historical. The Abraham stories. You know, you get the patriarch down to Abraham, the flood, Noah. You know, I don't know how much you want to rely on that, whether you think it's mythology, absolute truth. It depends how uh, fundamentalistly minded you are. I don't think that uh, some of those descriptions are so bad, so I don't see anything wrong with relying on some. I'm sure there was a 
flood in the Mesopotamian area at some time. <coughs> but I don't think the flood included uh, the island of Fiji. And I don't think Noah could get every living animal species into a wooden ark without their fighting like mad between them. And I just see how cats and dogs fight in my garden. So, uh, you know, I, I just don't, uh, you know, I, it's a nice story for you know, symbolic purposes, but taking it literally is not necessarily always the wisest thing to do in stories like that. I don't even think that the great story is that bad because it represents science up to the time that they knew it, and it's an evolutionary creative story. It's the first day God did this, second day God did that, third day God did that, meaning days, eons of time, however, but it's evolutionary, it's progressive, it gets more and more sophisticated. I think that's a pretty good science. Uh, I don't know why the creationists and the scientists are arguing so much, frankly. I mean, it's the science of, that's the science of like uh, 10th century BC. And the picture a 10th century BC person would draw. Okay, so this is the science of the 20th century uh, AD, the, what a 20th century AD person would, would draw. But I don't think they're that uh, far apart in the basic way they describe the evolutionary process. And man is a very high uh, step in the evolutionary process, and man would the development of man from the animals and so on. Okay, so that goes down to Abraham stories. A lot of people theorize that Abraham was a reflection of David projected backward in time. Abraham, David came from the town of Hebron. Uh, 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 Abraham comes from the town of Hebron. Abraham goes to the Philistines. They weren't even there at that time, so that isn't too. But here's Jerusalem. Here's not uh, here's uh, Nablus, here's uh, uh, Samaria, and then down here is Hebron. This is what today's West Bank is. All this is the Arab area now, and the Jews, uh, uh, the Jews nowadays live here, but in those days the Jews all lived here, and the Philistines lived on the coast, so the whole thing has just reversed itself for the modern period. But in any case, Hebron is in the south, and you know, David came from Hebron, so did Abraham come from Hebron. Hebron was one of Abraham city. So I don't know the validity of the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob cycle of stories. The storytellers were very artful at that time. But once you start getting down to the Joshua period, even the Moses character is like, everyone argues, when did he exist? Uh, was he uh, uh, an Egyptian? Freud says, have you ever heard of Freud's book, Moses and Monotheism? Sigmund Freud wrote a book at the end of his life called Moses and Monotheism, where he says that Freud is an Egypt, uh, uh, Moses is an Egyptian prince who came to the Hebrews. That's why he needs Aaron to talk for him, because he couldn't speak Hebrew. And uh, he actually looked like an Egyptian prince, talked like an Egyptian prince. 